So welcome everybody to the first edition of the MJ Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Jones, with the one and only... <laughs> Maria Jones. Maria Jones. <laughs> there she is in the flesh. Maria, how are you? I am doing fantastic. Great to be here. Of course. So, yeah, we just want to kick this podcast off and just get in touch with a little bit of who you are as a person, as a businesswoman, because there's a lot to delve into. So, why don't we uh, take it back a little bit and just discuss, you know, who you are as a person, what kind of started the search into the law industry, and why you decided to come to the U.S. in the first place where my parents and my the entire family were in the legal field and uh, it was sort of a given for me to follow their steps so to speak and go to the law school so of course as a little girl I had dreams of becoming a very successful actress or uh, sports uh, player or something like that. I, I was good in a lot of things actually so sorry I'm a little bragging about myself but um, so one day I come home and my mom said okay we're um, you're going to law school and I said well how about me being an actress and she said definitely you will after you graduate from law school do whatever you want after that so of course that was the end of my actress career. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, didn't you want to you also wanted to do ballerina stuff on the side as well. Right? Yeah, ballet. I like l little. Literally, the list was very long. So my mom keep keep watching me doing things when I was little, and keep watching and saying, "Yeah, it could be your hobby." Hmm. But first and most of all, let's get serious about your career. So you follow the family's uh, footsteps, and um, becoming a lawyer that was not even a question for me. So she picked a lawyer because her father was a lawyer, right? Yes. Okay. And what she did is actually, you know how your parents wanted to, um, you understand it when you become your, a dad, uh -huh. Uh -huh, when you have your own kids. So your parents always try to teach the kids not to make mistakes the parents did. So mm -hmm. what happened, in, um, so my, my grandfather, my mom's dad, was a city prosecutor and uh, she comes uh, from the pretty uh, good wealthy family and um, so she was a little rebellious child and Your mom? yeah my mom <laughs> yes and um, so uh, of course her dad wanted her to follow his footsteps to go to the law school for for sure and then um, she said no because there was um, a pretty cool trend those days in what 60s 60s 70s uh, a lot of people um, it was really popular for them to go to engineering schools and that's what she chose to do even though she absolutely is not an engineer she actually is born to be a, a lawyer or a judge or a prosecutor yeah. it's like literally the gift that she was given and she sort of dismissed it because she followed the trend and she wants to be a cool girl, you yeah. know. And after that, that um, she made sure <laughs> I went to law school because she did not. Mm. So she wanted to live almost vicariously through you because of what she didn't do. Yeah, and that's um, a long story in another topic of our maybe future podcast, like how your parents are trying to leave through you and uh, you know we ended up as children right so don't quote me on that one so we ended up I'm talking about me being a child not you being my child uh -huh. so and we ended up um, uh, really leaving our parents on um, what is it called uh, what's the word for that like um, the ideology almost the life that they fail to leave so they trying to catch up on the, their dreams right through the children's dreams. And yeah. believe it or not, I know so many friends that uh, they put their children to law school and the children's passions were something else. Uh, and believe it or not, they spend what is hundreds and uh, thousands of dollars on the law school and they yeah. graduate the law school because they had to, because they're good kids, because they really obey their parents and they want to finish what they start doing. And uh, at the end, they changed their career. So one of my friends started baking or start um, putting movies together because that was her passion. Mm. But we had to go through those things, I believe, that uh, really open our minds to say, 
at least you know what you don't want to do for the rest of your life. You tried it. Like I said, I tried. I went to, uh, I went to uh, courts. I went to the hearings. I've done that, been there. I want to do something else type of thing. Mm. So some, uh, some girls I know that went to law school and they ended up uh, going to ballet <laughs> and teaching ballet. Right. Like, believe it or not, it's just like it's a path you have to take. And if you're off the path, and hopefully you realize that before your life ends, or be, like until you're still in good shape and health, so you realize that, oops, I am on the wrong path, so let's mm. correct the course and go into what you actually meant to do when you came to this planet. Interesting. How common is it for lawyers, especially nowadays, or at least in the Phoenix area, from your observation, how common is it that they actually follow in their parents' footsteps? For instance, like say if a lawyer has, um, or someone that's, uh, they already have a practice, how common is it that they follow in their parents' footsteps to go after that law firm, to extend that family business? I see that every other person doing that, and they're proud of it. You know, uh, and I think there's something to be proud of that their parents, especially when they start something from scratch and build it, build their career, build themselves as a very successful lawyers and especially the judges in the family. Um, so of course those people, they're, they're, those parents want to see their kids to really um, take over, like inherit those uh, ideals, uh, those career paths, those something that they work hard for. Otherwise, I would think that they, they ended up saying, Lord, I put it all together for you, why you don't take it? <laughs> you know, yeah. it is a, it's like you're putting the burden on the child, I built it for you, and you're like, I didn't ask you to do it. So why? So of course it's beneficial if there is a match, if there is a alignment between what parents were doing with the children and the children really want to do it, like truly not because they want to please their parents, but they really want to truly to do that because they were born to be in the legal field. Mm -hmm. That's like a ta-da, that's the win. Otherwise, you're forcing or you're just almost like not, con you're convincing by, by forcing the children to do that like what do you mean you don't want to go to law school you have to go, like my mom like what do you mean you're not going to law school you you go and then we'll talk but like after five years of law school that i went through is like oh, i invested so much time and money in this of course i don't want to change my career even though i could have but this is all my mind my mindset was set up for that way my path i thought it was set up this way but then during those years of practicing law after you graduate from law school and you went through pains like literally you can ask me those questions it's like uh, okay uh it's just like trying to forget something that uh very difficult to forget but it got me here where i'm today so i'm grateful what age did you start did your did your mom start saying okay here's the law books study well, she didn't give me the law books, but she's almost like she was very great psychologist. Uh, she still is, right? <laughs> so, oops, I'm glad oops. she's there. <laughs> Did I see you there? No, no, no. Uh -oh. uh oh, so, but I think she knows what she's done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, I'm very grateful that um, I was put, I actually had this deep conversation with my mom and she had of course the big influence on my life in my uh viewpoints on life and the career and the woman and of course like she she brought me up uh as an independent woman not relying on anybody so i have to be responsible for myself and figure it out how to live my life without anybody supporting me so which was a good independent strategy but also like I, i'm a woman i'm not a man right Ooh, i'm gonna go conquer the world right so but yeah that that was starting with the early age for me so she is she's always been really great in the communication and uh she did not say she she never told me what to do but uh by asking the right questions uh like i love tony robbins for that it's like okay you want to get the right answers ask the right questions my mom was master in that mm -hmm. so she never told me what to do or give me the statements but she always asked me questions that leading to the statement that she wants me to come up with <laughs> Very clever. I'm still learning how to do it with you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and um, it started in the early age with regards with what 
sports I want to play, what people um, uh, I want to hang out with. And she was huge about environment. Mm -hmm. And only know like right now when I'm reading a lot of books and going through a lot of seminars, I understand that. You know what? She did try to create that environment in the friends and, you know, people that I am, uh, I, I was acquainted with or hang out with. She, from, I remember from the kindergarten that she's like, you can't talk to this person. That person is bad influence on you, like cussing and doing other bad stuff. So she was really punishing me for if, if she saw me hang out with that individual. Even with boyfriends, yeah. And, oh yeah, she's like, oh, that boy, th <laughs> only through my dead body you're going through to marry this guy. <laughs> so I was like, she was really selective. It's almost like, you know, in India, the casting and stuff, like yeah. you marrying this good, like connecting. She was not that bad, but she was very protective, like what kind of influence I have. Mm. What, what influence I'm getting from outside of the world. And she, of course, she was not there 24 seven. She had a full-time job, but I, I believe she put a lot of effort and time in order to protect my environment so I can grow up with this mindset of abandon, abundance, wealth, you know, clarity, intellect, knowledge. So speaking about environment, let's go over some things because a lot of people, especially in the U.S., right, they think of, you know, growing up a certain way and you have access to different things. Talk about kind of your upbringing in Russia mm -hmm. and how different that is compared to the U.S. Word. The only word I can tell you is discipline, discipline, discipline. <laughs> it was not military, military style, but close. that was close. <laughs> yeah. It was close enough. I mean, I literally had, um, a, a, you know, the journal that my parents were giving me the a grade uh, for um, did I make my bed the right way? Uh, is my clothes folded the right way? Is my room looks clean? Is the homework is done? So every day I was graded how was my day. I mean, that's pretty like pretty dramatic sometimes for the child. Oh, I just want to be a kid. I just want to be messy. I just want to have a childhood, which I did. Amazing childhood, but so there are certain things that I never, I was never bored, you know. I always go to like, okay, I have a swimming lessons, I have like, you know, a dancing class, or I have a drawing, uh, you know, class, or I have to do the homework, or I need to, I always been busy. And the fact is my parents, both of them were a full-time job, they had full-time jobs, so they never were home. So I'm the only child. And uh, um, I literally, like, almost every day find myself by myself at home. So there was no child protection in Russia. <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, in the U.S., you would be like somebody knocking at the door is like you were abandoning your child. But I had to grow up really fast because I, I had a key from the apartment. I have to learn how to heat up my lunch. Um, I have to put the, clean the dishes, put them away. And you're talking about, like seven eight years old mm -hmm. kid mm -hmm. like i'm not talking about teenagers that they know what to do and uh you know i have to know how to uh, light the matches and uh uh you know then put the dishes away and do the homework and by the time my my parents are home 6 p.m um, I had to show them, like, I, I know I've been graded, uh, they're going to grade me, so the, 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 my room should be uh, spotless and in good in order. Uh, my homework has to be done, and uh, all the dishes were put away, and I, I had to prove that I ate. Let me guess who did the checking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they took turns, because my, my mom also... Um, wanted to make sure that uh, if uh, it's bad cup, good cup, strategy mm -hmm. if my mom was a bad cop so she made sure that my dad is very sweet and nice and, and loving to me because if mm -hmm. she's like you know had the whip she had he had to have a candy right. so it, and it, it's nice to have this type of balance because imagine like living uh, every day thinking like both of your parents like after you <laughs> every day is like if something went wrong but uh they came from the um i think idea of um you know, putting the discipline in my head, creating that mindset for myself, it's really going to help me in future. So, of course, they did it from the, you know, kindness of their hearts and did the best uh, they can in order to to grow me, uh, to so I can grow up uh, to with all the tools that they can provide to me. And the number one is discipline. 
Mm. Mm. So your mom, she did some teaching, but before that you said, so she went into engineering and mm -hmm. then was your dad also an engineer? Or yes. What did he do? Yes. They both went to the same university. Yes. Mm. So they both, and they helped each other to study. Well, had me at the same time and, uh, you know, I don't know, sometimes we put ourselves uh, in these situations that you have to really, you know, put so many plates uh, in the air in trying to really do a lot of things at the same time. Uh, but I think it's like cultural thing. I think it's like, okay, we're, if this comes in and I, I'm doing this and this and this, I can do all of that. I can, I can handle it, you know. The, the thing is like, yes. So both of them were in school when they had me. And uh, so there was an engineering school. And both of them had really good positions, professions, uh, developed until, you know, the, the crash of Soviet Union. Of course, they lost everything. So mm -hmm. their diplomas were like nothing uh yeah and uh you know they they made the best out of everything and that's what uh, I, I admire still up to these days in my parents that they're uh they really have positive attitude and everything and they're just like okay this is the way it is let's make the best out of it we'll figure it out everything is working out for us and uh you know i remember we didn't have food in the house and uh you know my mom really went to the store and stayed uh in lines and huge lines, like sort of like similar to food stamps that we have here. Yeah. So we had something like that, and uh, not a lot of times they ran out of the products and uh, you know food. And by the time, like after two hours on in line, so you stand and then you come home with maybe a little bit of bread, and uh, you have to feed the whole family yes. and. Uh, my mom was, I remember like one time, like, I don't want this bread. I don't want to eat it. I want like meat and or I want to do something different. And I saw the tears on my mom's eyes, like, okay, well, this is the best I can do right now. And yeah. you don't want to eat it. So I don't want you to die from hunger. So I remember like, the, I have a, a, you know, like very uh, flashes a little bit here and there from the childhood. So I was very little. So it was difficult to remember because I don't understand what was happening at, this, at that time. Like, what do you mean we don't have food? It's like it's like a given thing for me, so I don't have to worry about it. But I remember that look in my mom's in my mom's eyes when she was like, she could not even say anything, but her eyes said everything to me. And I'm like, okay, just eat that bread and go to bed. Mm. Yeah. So fast forwarding, now you're in law school. What brought you to the U.S. ultimately? Or um. So I was an extremely um, outgoing uh, law student and we had, um, I was lucky to have the professor who literally believed in me and really became a family friend later on. I called him my uh, second father of law. <laughs> you, you know, three fathers. Yeah, <laughs> let's speak about that. Uh, yeah, let's talk yeah. about your three fathers. Three fathers, it's like, you know, three kings. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know how it just happened to be this way. I'm not making up, I swear. Right. So uh, the first one is my biological father, of course, who gave me birth. So that's my loving dad, his, um, you know, amazing support. And we're very connected on a very soul level, very high level, spiritually. Uh, with my second dad, it's when I started going to law school. So I didn't have much money and a lot of people, a lot of students, my, the one that I um, go to law school with, went to law school with, they were, uh, they were coming from very successful families, very wealthy families. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of times, like my mom made my clothes. Like I was wearing the clothes that my mind saw for me oh, and they Gucci or whatever. And they are wearing like Chanel, Gucci, you know, Adidas. It was like pretty big, big deal for us over there. And I was like, I felt so small because I don't have those clothes. I don't have those jewelry. Uh, you know, some of the students were driving um, to the law schools in Mercedes or BMW. So it, it's been it's been really dramatic for me, dramatic experience uh seeing that how how poor i was mm -hmm. and how wealthy other students are around me so i imagine like i'm there right from the suburbs from the small town and they all are from the top cities 
uh, you know, from the fathers or mothers, like businessmen, very successful entrepreneurs, and of course they had tons of money, so for whatever they're doing is like a piece of cake for them, right? Go to law school, pay for law school. Yeah, we pay cash, like no problem. What else you need? Oh yeah, BMW, here you go. Oh, Gucci, or what? Yeah, have double or have t the, two, two pairs of Gucci. Anyway, so he saw that, I believe that my law school professor saw that, uh, you know, potential in me. And he, maybe he felt a little bit sorry for me, I don't know. Uh, but he really sort of uh, took me under his wing mm. and um, supported me throughout the law school. Of course, my parents were huge supporters, like I don't dismiss that. But he was just there almost every day to say, hey, what do you need? What kind of support do you need? What can I do for you? And still, I, I wanted to quit many times. I'm like, you know, it, it's very difficult. Uh, and I know I, I talked about my story that it was almost like I didn't have money for law school at all. So yeah. I had to really come up with the money uh, somehow. So I wanted to quit many times and he was there always like, no, you can do it. What can I do How you know, to support you? So I, I definitely give him a big credit of me finishing the school. <laughs> so because many times I, I was ready to give up. Yeah. So did he, did he support you other ways aside from financially? Did you have, I guess, some like locker room talks with him? Did he like say like, is this, if this is what you really want to do, X, Y, and Z or what kept, what kept you going through that aside from the financial side of things that made you continue on and say like, no, I'm never going to quit. Where first I, I was raised that whatever you start, finish, mm. regardless where, unless it's uh, threatening to your life. Okay, so everything like a lot of people's like, hey, yeah, it's too difficult. They start something, the moment they figure it out, oh, it's too difficult, they drop it, and they never finish something. The project, the school, the the job, whatever it is. Why are you looking at me? <laughs> Just saying, and uh, but it's not, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of procrastination or don't finish what you started. Like finish, don't start it. Or if you start, you know you have to finish it. And it's like in the race, right? You're in the finish line or you're in the middle of the race and it's hard and you're dying or you're, you know, you're sweating, your body hurts and you still have to finish. You still have to go to the finish line. Otherwise, why to race? Why you get into the race if your final goal is not to finish, mm. not to get to the finish line? So I think that is more like, okay, where I finished, I, I started the law school. I had difficulties of paying, so we didn't have finances to do that. And for me, it's always like, what if? So what if I continue and it's, everything is working out? So I guess I had to have that you know, the understanding that finish what you started, number one, and also some belief in faith that it will work out somehow. And I don't have the answer, but it's a, it's a five year law school. So it's not three years like here. Oh, wow. So it, it's a five years every year. I have to come up with the money to pay for the law school. And uh, it, it's, it's to the point like I did not even think about how it's going to happen. I just knew that it will happen somehow. Interesting. In the third father, it was yes. <laughs> the yes. third. So the, the third father is when I already moved to the United States. So um, I applied to many, 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 many law uh, or the law firms actually after I graduated. And they never wanted me because either I was overqualified or no experience. So <laughs> overqualified or no experience. Yeah, you know, I'm like, okay, well, that's why I'm applying so I can get some experience. So nobody wanted, like, literally, I, I sent out 500 resumes, and a lot of people, like, no, 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 no. Like, okay, that was overwhelming amount of no's. So I'm to the point, like, a little bit down, doubting myself. Like, did I really? Uh, pick the right path to go through or the right career for myself. Maybe it's not for me, you know, maybe it's not for me. Until one day I received one response <laughs> out of 500 resumes, one response. One out of 500? Yes. And he's like, Maria, that's my immigration father, I called him because that's how I ended up doing immigration law. I started my practice with immigration law and then we added criminal law and personal injury later on. But my biggest uh, 
you know, biggest, I, I guess, success in the legal field started with immigration law that he hired me, hired me for free for the couple of months. Mm. Uh, and he said, yes, Maria, like, yeah, you, I'm building the immigration law firm. Would you like to join me? <laughs> so I don't know what I'm doing, but we'll figure it out together, I guess. You're an immigrant, so I, I'm building an immigration law firm, and um, let's see where it takes us. For $10 an hour, uh, <laughs> building the immigration law firm from scratch, uh, that was an interesting experience. Interesting. So he was already building his practice from scratch and he was like hey let's i'll take you along with me for the ride or yeah it's a, a sort of like here's the challenge are you ready <laughs> i'm like okay uh but he's like i cannot pay you and <laughs> so, so he came to you and said okay let's do this and then so for the first three months of that you worked for free or did you two yeah so for two months for two months and when uh, my husband then said hey i'm paying you to go to work <laughs> So I'm paying you for the childcare. So I'm paying you for the gas. You're driving the car for the time. So I'm literally just paying for you to go to work. Where I said, okay, it's for experience. And at one point it was um, two, two months. Maybe it was a trial. I don't know. Um, and uh, he he said, okay, well, how about ten dollars an hour? I'm like, I'll take it. Any money at that point. So it's going to be more than, better than zero. Right. So, and uh, well, he used to be in the banking industry. He was a very successful attorney oh, okay. for, um, so he, he, he never did. Be, like when I met him, he just started open immigration practice, but he used to, to- Are we able to name drop him? Yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, and then um, uh, after that, uh, so he basically started uh, immigration law from scratch, mm -hmm. even though he is uh, my, biological father's age so but he's the one who introduced me to immigration law for two years i worked for him in building the practice and learning everything so it was good it was a great experience we remained fr friends until um you know he passed away and um i uh, greatly miss him uh his wisdom his sarcasm i like his so he's a pretty sarcastic guy, but it was really awesome uh, having those kind of conversation about clients, about the law procedures, you know, all this other fun stuff that I cannot put it on the camera that we discussed. Uh, but uh, he was fun to to be with and to, to spend time with. Yeah. Awesome. So now let's get to you actually starting your practice. So. Why did you finally say, okay, I want to take it upon myself to actually sit down and actually figure this out for myself? So what was the cause of that, of you wanting to say, okay, I want to be my own boss from now on, and two, I can actually like do it, actually do the lawyer thing myself? Oh my gosh, that's, um, I did not even dream, in my, in my wildest dreams that I, Actually, at one point, one day, I opened my own practice in the United States because it was scary. In fact, it was so scary that uh, because I have an accent and being an immigrant, I thought I would never even go to litigate a case in court because I have so much disadvantage over other people because they were born here, their English is perfect, they use the very fancy legal words that I don't know, and they can win the cases better than me, and I don't want to be like mediocre attorney. So I said, I'm probably not going to do the litigation and not going to court and not growing big. Uh, but the, the, the whole reason I even ended up with opening my law firm is because of um, my that second father, well, third father immigration uh, attorney that I worked for for t two years. And there is a reason there was a mark of two years. I guess I was ready to fly out of the nest, but it was more like a kick in the butt. It's like, okay, go fly, uh, go fly. Uh, we don't need you. So um, I, I'm moving in a different direction, Maria. So uh, go ahead and do whatever you want with your life. But I appreciate your help. Good luck. Nice. So you just sat you on the street. Good luck. Figure it out. <laughs> Figure it out. And I'm like, what do you mean, good luck? <laughs> and uh, um, at that point, I was... Um, I was mad. You were mad? 
I w first of all, um, no, first I was victim. I was, um, I, d I, I cried and I got upset at him and I'm like, how dare he? It's like, I went to completely victim mode and then I'm like, okay, we're, <laughs> what I'm going to do with this victim mode because it's not helping me. Remember, I was raised in the discipline and achievement. Yeah, I'm, I'm achiever. Mm -hmm. I want to achieve things. And I'm like, okay, whatever life throw my way and I have to figure it out what to do with it. Like, remember that the bread I had, like I have to figure it out, like to pretend it's a cheesecake type of thing, <laughs> you know? So make it whatever, whatever you make out of it. It's, it's your brain, it's your imagination. Anyway, so I came home, I cried, and I went to the victim mode, and then I, and then I got mad. That's after I'd been a victim. So I got mad, and, and uh, the first words came out of my mouth is, I'll show you what you lost. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and literally that created so much fire, so much passion, so much, uh, desire to to succeed in this field, even though I felt like I still have dis disadvantage of people who were born in the United States as an immigrant, and um, but that even fueled me even more. Sure, you know. And um, the second thought, so this is like I'll show you the first one. Then the second thought it was, oh my God, nobody will tell me what to do. How I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> how I'm gonna do it. What do you mean I have to build my own calendar? I have to tell myself what to do every day. Nobody else will. I'm not going to report to anybody. I have to report to myself. I freaked out because all my life I was told what to do. And now... I'm in control of my life. That was a freaky moment. You have, like you <laughs> laughing right now. I can laugh with you as loud as yeah. I can. But at one, that point it was like, it was freaky. What do you mean I am my own boss? What do you mean I have to put my calendar? What do you mean I have to get up at a certain amount of time in the morning and I go to work and I build a practice and I have to come home? So, but it didn't last long. <laughs> I really... <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it and loved it. And that's what, when I said, oh my gosh, everything my parents did for me, right now, at that moment, I needed it the most. Because you had to hold yourself accountable. Discipline. Yourself. Yes. Mm. That's it. And then I create whatever they did to me. I start doing it to my employees, <laughs> you know? So the discipline, the, the reports, the inspections, the mar like, you know, we start small. We start very small. It's me and my secretary, Prisma, and yeah. uh, you know, and uh, and then I just did not think. You know what? I just I just went for it. And right now, like somebody asked me the other day, if I looked back and I start calculating the loss and profit, and marketing expense and balance sheets and stuff like that, I think I would never open the firm. Really? Because I would talk myself out of it because it's too much. It's too much to know. It's too much. I did not know the business side of it. I knew. I went to law school. That's all I know. I built a little bit of uh, a little bit of praxis. Helped my third father to do it, and then uh, and then what? You know, I have to build the business they don't in the form of little side of things in law school. Ha ha ha! <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> Isn't that a funny question? And maybe that would be the idea to like bring the business classes, not business school into law school, but that would be great to combine something like this because so many people, so many people are becoming entrepreneurs, including lawyers. I'm really happy to see that. Whatever happened 10 years ago, by the way, so I did not that, see that trend in lawyering mindset. In law, all lawyers, um, I just want to be a lawyer. What about p &L? What about cost per lead? <laughs> what about uh, ROI? What's ROI, right? So, and it's not like I'm, I'm, I am trying to put lawyers down because they went through hell. They went through law school. They took the bar. They have to uh, live by the highest standard of the legal practice. So it's a lot on its own. Mm -hmm. But a lot of lawyers right now are going and opening their own businesses and it's sole practitioners or building the big law firms or little law firms, you still have to know the basic of business. You can't just say, I am a great lawyer. 
you're now a business person. Right, because at the end of the day, running a law practice is a business. Yeah. It is. It is a business. Why? Because you take money and you have to file taxes. So it is a business. <laughs> uh, it's just in the form of a legal practice. And I see, I'm very happy to see right now, 10 years later, like 10 years ago, that was not like that. It was uh, a lot of lawyers were struggling. Uh, you know, they'd rather work for somebody else because they don't want headaches. They just want to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. They don't want to manage people. They don't want to manage staff or they don't want to manage uh, the bank account. So right now, I'm actually seeing the huge trend of lawyers educating themselves in the business field. And I'm very, very, very pleased to see that in a lot of lawyers becoming independent contractors or they opening the law, law firms. And um, it's awesome. It's really awesome. There is a lot of struggle still there. And there is a lot of courses and education. Maybe I, uh, based on my 20 years experience, can share some of my wisdom, some of my experience to them, uh, because I believe that at this point, point of my life, it's, it's awesome to give back to the younger generation or younger people or younger lawyers or not that young lawyers, maybe somebody who really needs that education, the business education from the experience because I didn't go to business school. So, sure. Yeah. So 20 years. Yes. 20 years. Uh, that was back in, was it January or February? January 20, 2004. I even wow. cannot count that far, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Don't remind me. Yes, I feel you made me feel old right now. Okay. <laughs> so let's go back. I kind of want to travel back and just take me through some of the years um, of what it was like starting off to where we are now. So the first five years, what was that like in terms of getting it up to that point? And the five-year mark hits. Where are you at? Kind of what are you thinking? Mm. Trial and error. I think this is the mark of... I did not... I did not follow the, you know, where do I see myself five years from now? Where do I see myself 10 years from now? I was like day by day survival mm. kit <laughs> um, because it's, um, you know, it's of course a little blurry right now, 20 years. It's been 20 years, uh, but I remember the 10 year mark. Uh, that was difficult one, um, 20 year mark. It was difficult. It's just like 10, like decades for me. So first five years, it was let's go to, let's, let's, let's get going guys. And I literally pour my soul and put myself out there. You know, <clears throat> the sky was the limit for me. And, uh, I literally burned the ships. There is no way for me to go back. Meaning go work for somebody else or give up on this project, on this baby, because I start just growing that law from growing that baby from scratch, pouring so much energy, so much time in it. So sometimes forgetting your own family when you're living basically 24 seven and building in and, and um, changing and adjusting and uh, working and like learning so much through this um, difficult, like it was very difficult to learn, but it was exciting. It was exciting because when you see the results, when you see the results of your efforts and all this uh, timing put, putting into this building the business, and suddenly you start having clients calling you or um, have great employees helping you, uh, attracting new people into your life. You start seeing so many changes and it's awesome. And it's awesome to see. I think I was buried in the, in the pile of emotions uh, every day uh, while going to work. I was driving one hour each way. Um, that helps, by the way. So, you know, I was so... You're driving long distances? Yeah. It's just like, okay. Um, we would drive, I was driving to work. It was downtown. From our house, it was like one hour, 15 minutes. And I was so upset that I had to drive so far. And uh, until one day I said, you know what? I cannot change the driving time. I cannot make it faster. I still have to drive. Mm. What can I do about it to make it the best drive every day? Guess what it was? What was it? Audiobooks. Audiobooks. Yes. And um, of course, 
my friends, the, the network of my friends were absolutely incredible that time and their support, and like my family, my friends were there to support me to go through this shaky time because when you're building a building, it's like you don't know it's gonna survive or not at the five year mark. And uh, they were advising me like, what about personal and professional growth seminars? Because a lot of time, like I, don't, I did not know how even to deal with my emotions. You know, clients yell at me, I yell back at the clients. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not fun to have your own law firm. I have to be like a really bad person. <laughs> Until my, one of my really good friends introduced me to think and grow rich. Mm. And that became my Bible. In that book and I got it in every single version I want to have paper digital and audio so of course I cannot read when I drive so I got this audio book on think and grow the rich and it made uh, me almost into a different person a different businesswoman because the concept of course that book creates for you and your mindset is really sharpened uh, by all this, of course, the successful people and how it's more like then it was what 20 years ago. We did not have all these life coaches and all the seminars that is going on right now. It was minimum. So that book was really my savior. And I read it probably 20 times, wow. 20, 50 times. I don't know. I was listening and listening and listening. I got done with one chapter. I re-listened to it again. It's almost like I made my book part of, this book part of my DNA. And that, I believe, that saved me and, and helped me to really survive that, go through that first couple of years of very rough times with building the firm. Mm. Uh, that. Thank God I was driving an hour <laughs> each way to work and back. So with audiobooks, was there any other audiobooks that you were listening to at the time or what other audiobooks or books that you're reading currently do you think would be beneficial for, say, someone in your position, someone that's starting off, that's struggling, someone that wants to, you know, have ambitious goals and go out and get their business going? You know, it did not start from the day I opened my law firm. It started back from my teenager years because um, again bringing my mom back to uh, she gave me the book it was it, it was translation um, so about successful people um, that, that that really shaped my leadership uh, skills and uh, helped me to go through college as well that was before law school mm -hmm. so uh, how to influence people it be successful, I believe. That was the name of it, okay. uh, and uh, it's 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 very popular book. I would start there, and I really I took it to heart. You know, everything apparently I take I take it seriously. What things coming to my mind, the books, the people, the events, and everything, mm -hmm. I take it to heart. And I I if I love the book and I feel that there is a value in that, I uh, I really make it part of me, part of my DNA. I really like digest the book literally and taking anything uh, from the book and, and start implementing it. Otherwise, like, why are you reading the books? Why are you going to the seminar? Why are you uh, listening to the books if you don't implement it? Just for the entertainment or, you know, watch the movie. Waste your time. Reading a book is not part of your success. It's not, because you read the book for a check mark, especially this like marathon, how many books here I can read. Okay, I read five books a month. Oh my gosh, and what do you do with them? Why are you reading those books? Just to see I did it? Check mark? Or you pull it all apart and say every chapter of the book brings you something, some value that you can implement. So you take that one chapter or one book, take that one thing that you learn, the skill, the task, the mindset, anything, the exercise, whatever it is in that one chapter, and go practice it for 30 days. How you possibly can read five books, why, a month? Go practice in a month the one skill you learn from one chapter on one book. That's it. So like in, in the, that book, I was learning uh, a lot how to 
communicate, the power of communication with people. And they give you techniques, you know, how you can make it clear, how you can do the voice and stuff. So what I did is like, I take that one little skill that I wanted to master from that book. I stopped reading the book. And I went for 30 days to start practicing it on other people until I felt like I mastered it. I know 30 days is not enough. You know, we need to have like, what, 21 days uh, to, you know, Build like, like get rid of the old habit first <laughs> 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 to replace it. You cannot get rid of the habits, by the way. You replace it. Yeah, you replace it with the other one. So anyway, so yeah, so I believe the books are, you have to work it you know, pull it apart, m make the writings. It's, um, John Maxwell actually taught me that. You know, like that's the, the way you, you read the books for checkmark or you read the books to really learn something out of it uh, and implement it in your real life. Otherwise, why are you learning, uh, reading the book? So um, if, if your books are very shiny and they're not pulled apart and nothing is written on the book and stuff like that, so you're just reading it, reading it for the check mark. Why? Because in 90 days, you forgot about the book. You forget about it, what you read about, and what is the concept, and why even you picked up the book in the first place. Mm. So yeah, so that uh, Think and Grow Rich, I believe that is like a huge mark on my life. And uh, so every time I find myself somewhere low, um, I really picked it up and uh, it helped me to get to that five year mark, 10 year mark, 15 year mark. If you were to give advice for somebody, either someone going to a foreign country or a foreigner coming to the United States and them wanting to run a business in a foreign land, what advice would you give to them? That's a tough one. What advice do I give to somebody who comes from a different country? Or even if it's someone from to here the United going States. to a different country to open up their practice. Well, I don't know about the other countries, but I know how to open a business in, in the United States. Uh, because this is one of the friendliest countries to open a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, be honest with you, I would be shocked that that person will fail. The only reason they fail because they don't have a mindset of success. That's it. So you cannot fail in this country. You have everything, all the tools, all the supporting system, all the network, everything that you need to be successful in this country, at least I know that for sure, for a fact that you will be successful. The only thing stops you from success is your mind. Incredible. Work, right. work on your mind.